This is a Wyndham County hosted, but um, I think statewide attended, maybe even some folks from out of state, um, conversation about what a progressive economy would look like for Vermont, a Vermont that works for all of us. Really happy to be hosting, along with Senator Ballant, a conversation with Lieutenant Governor and hopefully future Governor David Zuckerman. Thanks for coming today, David. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and I look forward to the conversation. I think it'll be really great to go a little more in depth on some of these things. Sometimes in politics, we don't get to uh, explore. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Senator Ballant, do you wanna say anything to introduce yourself before we jump in? So for those who don't know me, I'm Senator Becca Ballant. I represent Wyndham County and I serve on the Economic Development and Housing and the Finance Committee. And I'm also the majority leader in the Senate. And I had the pleasure of working with David when he was in the Senate before he became Lieutenant Governor and have watched him really grow into the role of Lieutenant Governor. And although I'm excited to launch him into the governor's office, uh, we will miss him presiding over the Senate because he's done a wonderful job in that role. He's fair. He gives everybody a fair shake and I just, I will miss him. Mm. Thank and you. I am Representative Emily Kornheiser. I represent one third of Brattleboro. I'm really happy to be here today. I've served on commerce and ways and means and I'm really focused on what a progressive economy means for Vermonters. I first met David um, actually just buying corn off his porch when we both lived in Burlington and really happy to do um, much more work with him now and hopefully into the future. Today, we are going to go through sort of a series of questions focused on a progressive economy. People want to chime in in the chat, that would be most appreciated. It can, um, feel free to join the conversation in the chat, feel free to ask questions in the chat, and then I'll pause regularly to call questions out from the chat depending on how many people join us or don't join us or the shape of the conversation, I might ask people to say their questions aloud or I might just read them aloud, depending on flow. But please use the chat box. It makes um, someone early in the pandemic described Zoom as performing for ghosts. And I found that the more action there is in the chat box, the less it feels like I'm performing into an empty void. And I think that's true for all of us. So. Um, please join in to make this an engaged conversation. So the first thing we wanna talk about is a $15 minimum wage. And we know that the current governor has vetoed legislation on the minimum wage, uh, minimum wage increase at least twice. And I think probably prevented some conversations before that. And would love to just have a conversation. What would it mean to actually have a $15 minimum wage in Vermont? What populations would benefit? Um, what would life feel like, especially in this pandemic, but not just in the pandemic? Well, I don't know. Do you want me to start with some thoughts on that? Yeah. Okay. And uh, I, David, before you yeah. go, I just want to put one little thought in people's heads about this, that even if we were to reach $15 an hour by 2024, which was the original plan when we propose it to the governor, it would still only be about $13 in real wages. I just want everyone to understand that, that $15 is not exactly $15 in 2024. So I just wanted to keep that in mind. No, I think that's a really important point and, and somewhat along the lines of what I was gonna talk about as well, which is that um, as we increase wages with inflation, that just holds ground. Uh, and one of the reasons we've been pushing for and supporting increases to the wage uh, above inflation is to make up ground that's been lost over years and even decades uh, from sort of the peak, I believe, of the minimum wage, which was back in the late 60s with respect to real purchasing power. And uh, I also wanna uh, break down a myth as well because there's lots of folks out there that go, if it was $15, businesses would close tomorrow. And uh, we're not talking about a $15 minimum wage tomorrow. It's actually, an, a, the discussion has always been about a methodical increase to the minimum wage that would allow employees to start to make up some ground to meet their the real affordability gap that the governor talks about, but doesn't actually support policies that would address, uh, and uh, would allow businesses 
to do these changes over time as their model and their businesses can adjust. So I can even speak to it from my own business, our farm. Uh, if three years ago, the minimum wage went to $15 like that and jumped, I think, you know, by three or $4 in one year, no, it, it, it would have blown the business up. Uh, we would not have been able to make it. On the other hand, if we increase wages methodically, then the price of our product can shift a little bit. The volume of our product that we can sell will go up because more Vermonters will have more money in their hands. And we know that when working class struggling individuals in Vermont have more money in their pocket, they're not about to send it off to Wall Street to invest it. They're spending it at their local stores, gas stations, convenience stores, clothing stores, and so forth. And so one of the numbers I've been throwing out quite a bit during this campaign is with about 50,000 people in Vermont working at the minimum wage, a $1 increase, which equates to about $2,000 a year in their pocket, equates to close to $100 million in resources at the ground level of our economy, of people going to stores and buying more goods and supporting their local stores with those dollars. And so when people push back against raising the minimum wage, they're not really recognizing the raises to the minimum wage, excuse me. They're not really recognizing how that economically will benefit across the community, your local stores, which will then be able to pay their workers those increased wages. It's a self-fulfilling positive loop, which is really the opposite of what we've seen with the last 40 odd years of quote, trickle down economics, where what we've really seen is suppressed wages, more demands on public services, and increased concentration of wealth in the hands of a very, very few people. And so I think increasing the minimum wage is sort of a microcosm of the huge economic catastrophe that we've been slowly experiencing and we're really culminating in right now, but been experiencing over the last 40 years. I'm sure either of you could add some more flavor to this, but. Well, one thing that really sticks with me when we talk about increasing the minimum wage is remembering and feeling who's mm -hmm. really earning that minimum wage in Vermont. And that is almost entirely single mothers. It's not high school students working a part-time job. It's single mothers who are the primary often single earner in their household who are trying to buy groceries, who are trying to buy, you know, that extra pair of sneakers that you need every single season, trying to buy food for their houses, paying rent, um, caring for, caring for their kids. And so that increase in a wage that few extra thousand dollars, one will go directly back into the economy because those women are spending every penny that they earn. It's also going to make a huge difference in the stress that's in that person's home, people's ability to care for their kids, for the kids' ability to have less stress in their lives. It gets passed on to the school system. And the dignity of working in a job that is paying your bills is a really different feeling than working in a job that you know you're still not making it work. We have so many conversations. Um, in the state and across the country about how poor single mothers just aren't budgeting well enough. And if they budgeted better, things could just work out. And the, the pressure of that um, really starts to eat away at your soul a little bit. And so this little tweak to the minimum wage that we did slowly could make such a difference in people's sense of self-worth, their ability to care for their children, and would make it easier for those women to keep on going to work. And so those employers then, you know, the employers that pay higher wages, we know they have much better employee retention. And so that's the other side of it right. is better wages really keep people in their jobs. Right, the, the other piece I think that's important to remember is that we always talk about it, and David touched on this, which is we, we hear a lot from businesses that this is going to destroy 
uh, the economy, it's going to put people um, out of work, it's going to destroy businesses. This is the minimum wage is the most studied topic in, e in economics. So we have the data and we know that that, that doesn't come to pass. It's, it, it, we heard these arguments the last time Vermont went through and increased the minimum wage. It's the same arguments that, that come back around again. And what I want people to think about is two things in particular. One, real wages haven't budged for folks at the bottom in over a decade. At that, in that same time period, the top 20% got two thirds of the benefit from the Trump tax cuts, right? That uh, goes to your point, David, it doesn't, it doesn't trickle down. The other thing I want people to remember is that in Vermont, we talk about um, prices being so much more, um, prices on goods being more expensive than our neighbors. And when we look at the prices around New England, Vermont is fairly comparable. What's different is our wages are consistently lower. So those two things, I think, get conflated. And in fact, we see a real striking difference between us and our neighbors. Yeah, and the, the topic of uh, affordability, which our governor loves to use that word, although then I don't really often see policy to actually do anything about it, uh, is very clear. Uh, I think, I, I don't know which, place you got your statistics from, uh, Senator Ballant, because they're all over, the, many, many organizations have shown this, but Public Assets Institute out of Montpelier showed that, um, again, on average, our expenses are very similar for Northern New England, et cetera, but our wages are about 18% below the regional average. And so, of course, it's going to be hard. But when I hear the governor talk about it, he says, well, we have to cut taxes or, or somehow trim programs that's not going to change the expense side by much, especially for working people. Uh, but it is uh, what's really going to affect folks is raising their wages and closing that gap um, in terms of wages versus expenses. And um, Emily, you really touched on a lot of sort of who are who are the people in these jobs. And um, you mentioned single mothers. I think that's the, the largest plurality uh, people of color are disproportionately working minimum wage jobs. And sure, there are some high school and, and college kids working minimum wage, but it isn't what I think a lot of people imagine from sort of this throwback mindset of 30 or 40 years ago, where most minimum wage job earners are many, I shouldn't even say most, I don't know statistically, but many were new employees to the workforce and mm -hmm. learning many of the skills and traits that you need and, you know, Certainly, I get it as someone who hires a lot of new people every year in seasonal work. There's a lot of training to do and a lot of teaching to do. And some of that is around the job itself. And some of it is around the broader work ethic that you you hope people learn over time. And, and I get that frustration as an employer. But still, if we're all doing it together and we're all helping make all of these employees, um, not make, but teaching them some of these different skills, uh, they're often transferable to other jobs. You know, having, having the mindset of doing your job and sort of observing what's going on around so you can see how all the pieces of a business fit together, those are transferable skills that you take into whatever place you go. And, uh, but the reality is the percentage of people in minimum wage jobs that are first time job, you know, folks, kids, mm -hmm. is really small now. And our economy is, has been based on, as Emily said, single moms, um, members of, of community of color, uh, and, and often also seniors. There's a lot of seniors in minimum wage jobs because Social Security isn't covering the bills anymore either. And I think all of these things are topics for the broader progressive economy conversation around healthcare, uh, education, uh, paid family leave, and I think we're going to get into some of those things, but um, we've just systematically created a really disjointed economy that isn't allowing for the upward mobility that is the American dream. That's often talked about, and in fact, back to Emily's point, with the sort of pride in your work or the satisfaction of knowing that the work you do covers your expenses, that's part of this sort of work drive mentality of this country you know if you work harder you'll make it um which is sort of this mantra 
that if people aren't making it, it's their own fault. And I think we really have to just kind of blow that mindset up a bit mm -hmm. because there aren't enough jobs that pay well enough to say, yeah, if you just work harder so that you get the promotion that someone else isn't getting, there's enough jobs to be promoted into to get better pay. That also has disappeared in this country. So the, you know, if you're not working, if you're not making it, it's just your fault. You're not working hard enough. That is really demoralizing to a lot of people who are working really, really hard. And in fact, are probably budgeting better on the really tight finances that they have and a lot of people who are better off saying, you're just not managing well. Um, and that's that's a, an issue. I appreciate that. And I know I certainly don't budget as well now as I did when I was a single mom um, working, you know, bartending. Um, I also appreciate, David, what you said about how sort of all of the businesses are interconnected and what is sort of supports what might be the work that happens at one business supports other work, other businesses in the system. We know that when we have a $15 minimum wage, it levels the playing field in some ways for businesses because some businesses are paying their employers, employees a living wage and others aren't. And so by instituting that, we're able to help all of the businesses um, succeed. Another, in addition to sort of keeping employees on longer when you pay a higher wage, so another piece um, of what I would sort of consider an economy that works for all of us is family medical leave. We know that the current governor vetoed that a number of times. We know that's something that all of us have worked really hard on getting past. And I think it's an interesting conversation that I'd like to have about what family medical leave would have meant, particularly during COVID. But I think it's also important to not just think about what family medical leave means for the individuals who receive it and their families, but what it also means for businesses who get to take that expense off their direct books and move it into a state run system that might be much more efficient than the small businesses that are Vermont's heart. Um, so those businesses can really thrive. And so those are sort of the two threads I'd love one of you to pick up on, pick whichever one feels right to you right now. Senator, you wanna start? Well, one thing that I think ties both of these topics together that I just wanna make sure we don't forget to mention is that we have this sense often in committee in the state house that, well, why aren't these young people working you know, why aren't they working hard enough? Why aren't they making things work? I did it, why can't they do it? And the thing I always wanna remind my colleagues is, in fact, we didn't do it. So I'm, I'm a Gen Xer, folks who are of uh, the, um, the boomer generation. What we did was very different from what millennials have to deal with. They're carrying more debt and all of their costs are higher when adjusted for inflation. Housing, school, uh, the debt that they're carrying. So I always try to remind folks that I understand that you feel, and rightly so, you know, proud that you were able to take care of yourself on a minimum, minimum wage. College costs at that time made it possible for you to do that. And so I don't think we can separate the two as looking at who are we talking about in terms of who would benefit from this. And what the young folks, and by young, I mean really under 45, what they are dealing with is very different from folks who are over 45 in terms of debt and costs. Yeah, I think about my parents and when they, um, I think, purchased the home that I grew up in, and it was like two years worth of salary. You know, how many people today can consider buying a home in Vermont or really almost anywhere uh, and say, oh yeah, the average home price is really just two times or three times what most people I know are making. That's just not reality. Um, so that maybe is a way to put what Senator Balanch has said into like stark terms. You know, most people are looking at a, to buy a house and it's like, oh, that's gonna be the equivalent of six or 10 years or even more worth of pay. Um, so those are 
some of the differences. And, and as Senator Ballant said, the, the debt as well. And when I look at paid family and medical leave and, and sort of the picture of how that fits within a progressive concept of an economy that works for all, um, I also think about, admittedly, the governor's vetoes, you know, vetoing paid family leave, vetoing the minimum wage, um, frankly, even vetoing medical monitoring for people that are exposed to toxic chemicals unwittingly, you know, in their water or in the air they breathe, uh, because all of those fit within the economic reality. Those folks are going to potentially face huge health costs, not only financially, because frankly, that's secondary to me to the actual physical, emotional strain of illness that's brought on, some sort of cancer or a, a genetic um, difference in a child because of exposure to things like PFOA. And um, so a progressive economy to me is more than just dollars and cents, right? What does paid family leave really mean? It really means that when a parent has a child, when a woman has a child, and paid family leave, if it's holistic, but both parents are involved, um, means that there's bonding time with that child. And we are, we are seeing consequences where folks have children and within a week, they're back at work. And what does that do for the development of the child? What does that do for the development of that relationship? And, the, and, and even the nutrition for that child. Um, those are all very tangible, real consequences of an economy that really isn't working for all. And what does it mean when, you know, your parent is ailing and maybe just on those last few months and you're working 60 hours a week to make ends meet and you don't get to spend really any quality time with the person that reared you 30, 50, 70 years ago. Um, these are the kinds of things that to me mean a civilized society where we say there are things and times and moments in life that you ought to be able to have the time to do. And when you look around the world at other industrialized nations, they've just about all got this figured out except for us. It's embarrassing, um, much as I'm fairly embarrassed by this president as well as angered by this president, the broader issue of our economy goes well beyond our president. This has been systematic policy for 40 years mm -hmm. to um, move away from a, an economy that embraces family. I mean, I'll throw back another term from the Newt Gingrich years and family values or whatever the, the rhetoric they, they used to dupe people back then. Well, family values to me would be paid family leave, raise the minimum wage, universal health care, so that the economy isn't what drives our mindset every waking hour of the day. Um, and it's going to be a while till we get there. No one, we're not going to flip this overnight, just like we were talking about with the minimum wage. We're not going to have the robust paid family medical leave law that we'd want. We're not going to have a universal health care system immediately. Uh, this system is broken down for people for decades, but we've got to start to rebuild it. And I would say that it's not even just um, what a civilized economy would look like or what civilized families would look like. It's also just functional. So we know that, you know, family members leave the workforce when they don't have family medical leave, whether that's to care for a child or an older Vermonter, and then can't find their way back. And that employer has to lose that employee and then that person then has to reintegrate into the workforce. And that's a huge cost to businesses and to society when people exit the workforce completely rather than just be on leave. We know that people caring for older Vermonters, often there isn't another system other than family in place. Um, our healthcare system isn't strong enough to care for people at home or in facilities all the time. And so, we see families patching together these elaborate systems. I just had a dear friend go through this with you know, every family member at a three hour shift over the course of two months. And, and everyone's job suffered because no one had enough family medical leave for it. And then we think about this all in the context of COVID and where we've essentially used the unemployment insurance system as a stand-in 
for family medical leave. So people who don't have childcare can use unemployment insurance. People who are caring for a vulnerable family member or a sick family member with COVID can use unemployment insurance system. But that's not what that system was built for. And so it makes it incredibly difficult to A, have that system meet people's needs from an administrative perspective, and it's not funded adequately because it wasn't designed for that. And so I'm glad we've been able to patch together something that could be in moderate, um, what's that word, facsimile, um, that's a hard one, of to care for people in a crisis. But if we had been able to do this four years ago, we wouldn't have had to do that. And people would have been, a, had slightly less stress in an incredibly difficult and stressful time in all of our lives. And, and, and it I would have helped, oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, David. I was gonna say, it would have maybe not been a complete substitute for the unemployment system, but it would have alleviated some of the strain on the unemployment system as well. So it would have been both um, a smoother situation for those families that, that did have someone who was sick or suffering with COVID, um, but it would, have, it would have greatly reduced the number of people applying for a system that frankly also needed investment. And the governor, when he talks about balancing the budget and covering all our expenses, you know, when you defer maintenance on critical infrastructure, um, that's not frankly balancing the budget. That's just pushing it off to the future. And in a situation like this, we saw the cost of that. We saw months of people struggling to get through the unemployment system because they've checked one box wrong on an application and it kicked them out into the, you know, you might be a fraudulent applicant. Um, and just not having the staff resources or computer systems deal with that, which led to thousands of Vermonters. I know, uh, you know, Emily and Becca, you and, and everybody got hundreds of calls from frustrated Vermonters going, I did what I was told to do. And now I don't have food to put on the table for my kid. You know, that is just shocking in, in our society that that's what happened. And obviously we're very fortunate in Vermont. There are amazing mutual aid groups that formed and people help their neighbors. Um, and we're very fortunate but we shouldn't have to rely on that um, incredible community fortitude. And it started to break down because people right. can do it for a week right. and they can do it for two weeks. Not sustainable. And it's yeah. not sustainable at all. Because in the end, that's actually what government is for. It's people organizing to pool their resources so everyone's needs can get met. And so once a mutual aid network starts to become permanent, that's in fact just forming a government system that we ideally already have through our government and tax yeah. system. Becca, sorry, so, you were gonna say something. Yeah, no, I just wanna bring the humanity into this conversation um, because mm -hmm. we talk about this often in the abstract. And I just wanna tell a little story about, so my mom's best friend from high school, they've been friends their whole lives. And uh, a couple years ago, her, one of her, children came down with terminal cancer and she and her husband were able to take advantage of the family medical leave insurance program just across the border in New York. They didn't have to choose between whether they were going to uh, lose their jobs or whether they were going to miss their child's last few months on the planet. And they were able to take advantage of that program they were able to go um, and uproot themselves for a few months and be by his bedside while he passed. No family should have to make a decision between whether they're going to be able to support themselves or whether they're going to be able to see the child or their parents at the end of their lives. And when we don't have that at the center of the conversation, we have lost our humanity. Yeah, mm. hugs, Becca. Um, yeah, I, I I don't even know what to say after that because I think that really encapsulates what we're trying to talk about that you put in such better words than I did earlier when I was trying to say that when money is the focus as opposed to that, what you just spoke of. Right, and that 
you know, I think we often in government, we don't want to talk in those stark terms, but like we're talking about people and families and what people are struggling with day in and day out in our state. And, you know, one of the fastest growing segments of our population in Vermont are people over 80. We're going to have more and more people who need family with them to help them, to support them and not feel like they are spending their last years hoping and praying that they will have someone by their bedside when they really need around the clock care. And, you know, I think you can't put a price on that. And that's what I think the problem is in this, this, in this country is that we wanna be able to put a price on it. And it is priceless to have that time. And we ought to be able to figure out how to support families in that time. Yeah, and can I add something, Emily, to that? Um, you know, I also, let's think about that person who is 82. You know, we've been talking a lot about the individual who's working and having to choose between work and spending time with that family member who may be ill or passing eventually. What about that person? You know, if you are at the end of your life and you know your child is now in this position of having to choose, do, do you even tell your child you're sick because you're afraid of the stress you're gonna put them through trying to decide, do they keep in that hourly job struggling to pay their bills or do they honor you as their parent and, and beyond honor, just, just want to be with you and put them through that stress or do you wait to tell them till a week is left and you're really at the end why are we putting those folks in that position having so that that to me is the another side of that humanity discussion um you know that, one other piece of the other side of life um sort of birth and bonding we right. We know, you know, study after study and family and personal experience after family and personal experience that without universal family medical leave for all genders, that the person who gives birth is the person who takes the time off and probably the person who leaves their job. And one that really keeps the other parent, if there is another parent, from having the opportunity to do that early caregiving which will give them the relationships and the patterns and the skills to continue caregiving across the next, you know, Lifetime. 18 years if you're lucky, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and then a lot of teenagers in this, you know, in this the three of us. Um, and then the person who leaves work like will likely will never catch back up on their lifetime earnings on their wages on their social security on their salary on their savings on all of it they'll never catch up it's the one of the top reasons for the gender pay gap and yeah, so right. we know that universal family medical leave means equity at home but it also means equity in the workforce right, right. And it ties back to our conversation about minimum wage as well, that we know you are much more likely to be living in poverty as an elderly woman than you are as an elderly man because of what you have paid in. And so, and it's of course based on what um, you were taking home mm -hmm. as pay every week. So it, it's all, it all ties together. So we received, um, a billion to almost a billion dollars in COVID relief funds. Um, was that six months ago? Something like six months About ago. About that. And Emily, maybe because we did go live on Facebook, do you want to just remind anybody who's watching what we're talking about? Yeah, this is a Wyndham County conversation, Opera Representative Emily Kornheiser. We have Senator Becca Ballant here, and we're really excited to host Lieutenant Governor David Zuckerman, soon to be Governor David Zuckerman, if we all do our work and jump in both hands and full voices into the fight. Um, and we are talking about what an economy that works for all of us looks like, the particular policies that we would want in place if we could have a governor who doesn't say no and instead says yes. And um, 
getting into the the weeds and the humanity of it all together mm -hmm. anyway yeah thank you back to the question i'm sorry <laughs> yeah no appreciate it um so we received all of this money from the feds there were a lot of um parameters parameters thank you there were so many parameters to how to spend the money but we were still able to spend some of it in a way that i you know on housing for folks who didn't have housing um on some funds for undocumented workers some stimulus money there were some ways we were able to sort of push forward a small bit of an economy that works for more of us mm -hmm. i'm curious if we had more federal relief funds coming in, say the November election goes really well, and we have more federal relief money coming, how would you want to spend it to really create that economy that works for all of us? Well, it's interesting. I, I partly um, will want to hear some of your each of your thoughts because in the legislative process, you are in those meetings talking about how to use those resources how they could be most effectively used. And it was curious as Lieutenant Governor kind of swirling in for the final votes, but not attending every single one of those meetings that were just so intensively happening. Um, but I really looked at the whole process as one where there was a lens of money should go to businesses or money should go to people. And that the question is sort of chicken and egg, which way benefits both the most. Uh, and I really think when we put money into the hands of people, that's what churns the economy. When you put money into the hands of people, they go buy food, which pays employees at a store or restaurant workers at a place that for a while was takeout or maybe with limited seating or pays your rent or your mortgage and keeps all of the money going through the system again, sort of bubbling up from the bottom that makes it all work. When you put it in partway through the system, some helped relieve going down, but some only kept going up. And so to me, I view the lens and sort of the broad scope of how I would look at using resources in the way of saying, how does this go into the system in a way that benefits the most people as it's utilized over and over and over again? You know, one program that I know Representative uh, Gino Sullivan and Matt Byrong did a lot of work on was Everybody, Everyone Eats, I think it was called. Mm -hmm. And that was based on um, a, a great private sector idea uh, that I know the Skinny Pancake was doing, doing shift meals and maybe some others down your way. Wyndham County, doing, actually. Wyndham really, County, um, exactly. That, yeah. And, and um, they were just saying, look, they had a big commissary. They said, we're going to make meals and we're going to keep our employees working, and we're gonna get those meals out the door to people that need meals at as low a cost as we can. No, no real aim for profit, but to cover costs. And with Everyone Eats, the idea was to use state money to help make that happen in more parts of the state. And um, when you think about each dollar that went out the door to a restaurant, that then went to employees, that went to food distributors and farms who then paid their employees and their you know, uh, suppliers. And so whatever ways we could do that, whatever ways we could find to put money into the economy that would use over and over again is the lens I would take. Um, and I, I have to give a shout out to Senator Leahy. You know, we did get $1.2 billion by most standards in this country, it should have been about $700 million. And when I think about the accolades that our governor gets, and even today an announcement of, well, we're expanding this business you know, support program, what would this governor have done? And what would the legislature have done? But the governor is the leader. If we had 500 million fewer dollars to have put into all of these different supports, because the governor essentially early on when the budget looked like it was going to be tight was saying we're going to cut how are we going to cut our way out of this and if it hadn't been for that 500 million this governor would not be writing all these checks getting all these accolades for keeping things going um, i remember so, an, yeah sorry i remember an early meeting that i was in 
where the administration was testifying on these cuts that they were recommending across the board, just flat cuts across the board. And I said, are you making these decisions based on which departments might have more COVID related needs and which departments might have less? And at that point in the conversation, I was told, no, we are just recommending cuts across the board. It was really bizarre to watch. And, you know, things sort of quickly pivoted from there, um, maybe after all of our horrified faces, but it was, it was really surprising to see that happening. But I think part of what you're revealing is the mindset. There's different mm -hmm. mindsets in how we can approach these challenges. And, you know, I don't want to discount that it's always important to look at maybe there are places in government that over time can either be cut or made more efficient. We have programs that have been around for 30 years and it's really good to important to go to those frontline employees and the consumers of whatever that state program are and say, is this still working or do we have ways we can make it work better? So I'm all for finding certain efficiencies. And I think Senator Ballant knows that I've talked about human services and education right. and sort of all of these programs for families and kids. And are there places where we're duplicating services? Let's roll up our sleeves and get down and do that work. But that's a very different mentality than let's draw a line on a piece of paper that is two, three or 5% below what it was the year before and just say, mm -hmm. cut programs versus mm -hmm. let's methodically do this. Um, my dad was a surgeon and I won't get too gory here, but you know, you don't just make a cut all the way across the body if you're trying to work on a particular part of the body, you know, and, right. and, um, there's, there's a attention to detail. There's a thought process about humanity, which we were talking about earlier. And there's, there's, how do we use these hard earned resources that are Vermonters tax dollars as efficiently and effectively as we can. But when we're in a tough time like this, there really are two paths to take. And one is to just broadly cut, which is what this administration was prepared to do before, fortunately, resources turned out better than they expected. Or as Governor Snelling did in the early 90s, you say, wait a minute, there are certain people that have benefited from the structure of our society for decades. And this is a moment in time when our structure needs their help. And we didn't have to go there this past year. And I think so far, given the scale of the rainy day fund and the resources there and the scale of the shortcoming this coming year, we shouldn't have to go there for operating budget in the next year. I would still think about it for investments that need to be made in our economy, but that's a separate conversation for another day. But what is the mentality in office around state resources and who can pay and who's gonna get hurt by the cuts. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about if more resources came in, I would think about how do we use those resources to multiply them as many times as possible mm -hmm. from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. One example that comes to mind for me um, based on something that Senator Ballant said in a previous forum we were in about um, with a, the same question and something that you've been talking a lot about, um, David, was about the Green New Deal. and if we, just as an example, if we invested some of that federal money in housing, that's not that houses people who desperately need housing in all levels of our economy. That means that people will have jobs building that housing. So that's really direct benefits like living wage jobs in construction and planning and all of that. And then there's also the environmental benefits of having well heated, well insulated, you know, modern homes and housing and the health benefits related to that. So just sort of one small example of ways we can spend federal funds that will really benefit both the climate and the people. Right. And so I think since um, they didn't, many of the people listening in or folks who will watch this later may not understand that the funds that we got from the federal government were very restricted to, to a large extent. So there were lots of things we wanted to do with the money that we weren't able to do. And one is near and dear to my heart, which is we wanted to spend a lot of the money on 
really closing up the digital divide between more um, rural parts of the state and um, essentially Chittenden County. And there are, there are other pockets of good connectivity around the state, but in general, we see a breakdown um, in connectivity. And I think in the past, people have seen it about, you know, sort of it's a nice, thing to be able to have fast internet, right? And now during this crisis, we realize it's not just about a nice thing, it's about telehealth, it's about education, it's about if you've got to shift your uh, work life to your house and you still have dial-up, that's not really possible. If you lose your job and you need to shift into having some cottage industry out of your home, again, if you have dial-up or if you're not connected, you're not gonna be able to make that work. So we wanted to invest quite a bit of the funds into closing this digital divide between the haves and the have nots. And we were not able to put in the amount of money that we wanted to because it had to be a direct impact from COVID, which I always thought was a really funny way of talking about it. Like all of us wouldn't be home, you know, trying to be on these Zoom <laughs> meetings if it weren't a direct result of COVID. So it was, it was a funny mental gymnastics we were doing. Um, but I feel like this really has shown us all of the families in our communities that are cut off right now because they can't get on these meetings that we're all on or these forums. And it's a real, um, it's a real problem of not just um, the economy, it's a problem of democracy when people can't fully participate. Yeah, and I think going forward, um... Emily, and I don't know if we should be using formal terms. You all can call me David too. So um, I'm that's... going straight and formal. It's Great. after dark. And yeah. so <laughs> it's funny. So in the day. summer, in the summer, we have to stay formal till like 10 o'clock. And in the winter, we can go informal at 4 30. You Excellent. need it more in the winter, right? Oh, sure do. Um, back to humanity, right? We were talking about humanity earlier and, and just saving our souls from the intensity. Um, so what was I going to say? Oh, so with respect to um, next rounds of federal support, I think it's going to be a really interesting conversation to see what that is like. Obviously, it may be happening as we speak in Washington, right? Like, right, tonight is the deadline, supposedly. Um, deadlines often come and go and get rewritten. But um, will next rounds of federal support be restrictive solely around COVID? Will they be support for state and municipal governments for just operating with respect to the reduced revenues because the, in, the, the economy slowed down, in which case will there be more flexibility? Will there be around now and around next year? Because I do think there's, there's many aspects to this. One is, of course, filling the holes of the programs and, and, and supports that have existed in our state that are strained by lack of resources, but they're also being strained by an amplification of the demand. You know, there's a real increase in demand, especially around mental health um, because of the many levels of strain. There's economic strain. You know, we were talking earlier, and I think this was before it went live on Facebook. So I'm sorry, folks who are watching later that you missed part of that. Um, we had technical difficulties, but, um, when you're living under economic duress, working full time, trying to put food on the table, single mom working minimum wage, over time, that can create uh, mental health impacts. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so we are seeing that whether it's minimum wage with single moms, and we're also seeing it right now under COVID, whether it's just the stress of COVID and people being home and not seeing each other, whether it's economic duress and distress that people are going through, so we're seeing an increased demand for services. So I think some resources could go there. And then Can the question- Can I jump in and interrupt you for a second? Yeah, so yeah. We have a question from Facebook Live that I think is really relevant right here and I wanna cool. fit it in so we can get to it. And so someone asked, um, why can't there be one application for all the aid programs? Yes. And Yes. Um, and so I'm going to answer quickly and say there isn't one application for all the aid programs because people, there are people who work in government. Um, and I think our existing governor might be one of them who don't think that people deserve to get those aid programs. And so it's made as comfortable, as difficult as possible because everyone is assumed to be perpetuating fraud all the time. 
but I think David, you were about to say that one application would be amazing. <laughs> well, it's really interesting because I talked about that earlier this year uh, during an earlier moment in the campaign when I was talking about both the issues of human services and education, which I think I alluded to a, a little bit earlier in this conversation and breaking down the silos between agencies and government. But we also had a guest at that press conference, a woman who um, had two children and I think she said she had nine different forms and paperwork to go through, whether it was childcare support, food support, heating assistance, housing support, various different aspects of, um, of need. And it's insane to me that we don't have a single form. You know, that means you're putting your name down nine times. You're putting your social security number down nine times. You're putting all these different pieces of information down nine times. And you could be doing that once. And it may be that each one of those separate applications had two or three unique questions. But if they were all together and you applied once and we had not separate silos in our human services agency, but a one-stop portal that then you met with, maybe it was even three different people at the same time. And depending on your circumstances, it might be three people, it might be two, it might be four, but where it said, okay, what's the big picture here? What, are, what is the range of things that are needed to help you get through this moment? And I hesitate to use the words, quote, back on your feet, but whatever the term might be to where you can, you can get out of the, the programs because you will have gotten to another point in life. Not as a, you should be shamed for having government programs and support, but for the idea that for all of us, you're going to have more pride and dignity. You're also the, the state will have to have fewer needs and resources. Uh, there's, it just seems to me it's incredibly inefficient the way that these systems have been structured and built over time. And you just once in a while have to look at it and say, if we could rebuild this, how would we do it? Um, and I would love to do that with state employees on the front lines and say, where do you see the treadmill where people start to succeed and then they fall back off? And it's because we don't have a really well um, networked system. So on that point, um, we are nearing the end of our time. Whoa. And so this has been really fun. I could talk about this for another few hours, but I also need to go have dinner with my family. So I'm sure the same is true for both of you. And so would love to hear from you, Becca, any closing thoughts? And then um, David, Please, after Becca speaks, let us know how folks can get more involved so that we can see this progressive vision for our economy become a reality. So I think what I wanna say is I wanna bring it back to our, our families and our neighborhoods and our communities. And we talk in the abstract about the economy and what I want people to remember is everyone within your own neighborhood or on your road or in your circle of friends in, in some way fit into that larger concept of the economy. And what I know when I just sit here and think about all the different houses around me and all the different families and their struggles, I want us to be looking after each other. I want us even with our masks, to be checking in on our neighbors, especially as we head in to these dark months, especially as we were talking about earlier about um, the mental health strains that people are under during this pandemic. I want us to bring the humanity back to our work of being in community with each other and not being afraid to be honest with each other about when we are hurting, whether, whether we need help or whether we have health to offer. And, I think that's what, what I want people to remember. Mm. Yeah, thank you, uh, Becca. And I, I think about that in that there are times we are in a moment when we can help others and there's times when we need help. And we need to make it acceptable to ask for help, which is um, hard for all of us, I think, in this society, the way it's been structured. I also uh, sometimes think men have a particularly hard time asking for help, but I you know, so there's gender issues as well. Um, but we need, to, we need to be available to help people and we need to be available to listen to when they need help and, and when we need help to be able to ask for it. Um, and in sort of wrapping up, you know, I'm gonna go on the, 
the colder side of it all and just say, you know, part of this is who's making the decisions of how we allocate resources, how we obtain resources uh, with respect to taxes and fees and who's paying and who can afford to pay. And that decision is made in elections. And then those decisions are made by the people who are elected. And I think it's important not only for people to vote and to hopefully vote for the three of us here on this conversation, um, but also- Especially for you, to vote for thank, you. Thank you, I was gonna get That's there, don't we're worry. Here. We're here to get votes for you, Thank David. you, um, yeah. I do appreciate that. Um, and also though, to stay engaged beyond voting. Like voting is a piece of the conversation. But many of you who are watching this now or later, um, although when you're watching, I guess it'll always be now. All of you watching this, um, you have expertise and knowledge from your life experience. If you've gone through some of these programs and seen where they work or don't work, share that with your elected officials because we can only improve the systems when we know what the challenges or problems are in the systems. And we can do it partly investigating ourselves, but we partly do it with your input. But what I wanna say in terms of this election that's happening two weeks, like literally two weeks from two minutes from now, or maybe it's two minutes, two weeks from right this minute, the polls will close and decisions will be made that will have ramifications for years and decades to come. And it's important at the national level. And at this point, I'm talking about the gubernatorial level where we don't have time to waste uh, with putting, returning the current governor who has vetoed a climate solutions bill, who has vetoed minimum wage bills, which was a fundamental part of this conversation, which has vetoed paid family and medical leave bills, which has really not brought any vision to the office of governor with respect to how do we build going forward to create an economy and a humanity in our economy that I think is really at the heart of what we were just talking about for the last hour. And we have that choice. You have that choice very clearly, I believe between the current governor and myself, David Zuckerman. And many people wanna express appreciation of the governor because of how well Vermont has done with COVID. And I just have to touch on this sort of elephant in the room for lack of a better term. Um, I appreciate what the governor did. He did, however, what a governor should do, listen to science and medicine. Now, he's been held on a pedestal because right now most people in his party are not listening to science. And the comparison is the president, which is just such a low bar. I just can't even go there. And the governor deserves accolades, fine. We can call him, you can send him letters. There's lots of things you can do. But if you vote for him because of this, you are also voting for someone who has vetoed those critical bills. You're voting for someone who does not have that creative vision and that picture of what Vermont could be for all of us and really to bring up Vermont from the bottom and make sure that that person living on that road around the corner from you is not struggling to heat their home, put food on the table, access health care, be with their child, be with their mother or father when they're sick. That's the choice that's in front of you right now, is who is going to work towards improving that situation. And I hope you'll choose me. I also hope in the next two weeks, if you want to help, you'll reach out to Zuckerman for Vermont.com. That's Zuckerman, F O R V T.com. And most importantly, you'll talk with your neighbors and friends and use your own social media and your front porch forums to talk about why you're supporting me if you are and encouraging your neighbors to do so with some of the information you've learned tonight. So I thank you for that. And uh, Emily and Becca, thank you for the conversation because honestly, this has been one of the best hours of the nine months that I've been campaigning. Um, it's just really not an option very often to get into this kind of detail about why we're doing what we do. And um, it's often one minute answers. And so thank you for this opportunity because it's it means a lot to be able to have a deeper conversation. For us too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And thanks for everyone who came out today and everyone who is watching on Facebook Live. Um, there is, the details are in the chat for 
Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and donating and volunteering and please vote. You can drop your ballot in a ballot box at your town clerk usually. You can put it in the mail until this Friday and you can still go to the polls and drop off your ballot if you want. But just vote and vote for David Zuckerman. Thanks yes. everyone. Vote, vote your values. Vote your values. Vote for David. Thank Night. you everybody. Night.